Hello, and welcome to today's chapter of Books on the World, a presentation of the Cape Cod Writers' Center. We're pleased to welcome back Paul Kemp Kemprikos, who has been a regular author and guest on our program. And we welcome you back today, Paul. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Your newest book called The Minoan Cipher. Yeah. Uh, what is a, <laughs> let's start with a, a basic question, Paul. What is, or what is the Minoan Cipher? Well, that, that's a trick that you have you have to buy the book to find out. <laughs> or that we, will, we uh, won't tell any non-reader <laughs> yet about all the books. Well, uh, the Minoans were an ancient civilization on the island of Crete. And they, uh, very interesting, they were far ahead of a lot of civilizations at the time. And then they uh, sort of, did their civilizations sort of mysteriously ended and it was absorbed by the mainland Greeks uh, about 3,500 years ago. Now, Min Minoa is off of Crete, um, or is it part of Crete? Well, it, it got the word from the, the guy uh, who rediscovered the, the civilization, and um, there had been hints of it, but, but no one really knew that there was this entire, quite amazing civilization that controlled the whole eastern uh, Mediterranean. They were a maritime power. Uh, there was a big uh, eruption of a volcano, a volcano on the island of um, uh, Santorini north of Crete mm -hmm. and some believe that the ramifications from this were what destroyed the civilization. It's also thought that they might have been the inspiration because of their power and the great navy for the, for the Atlantis uh, legend. So they were m mainly in uh, Crete. Their origins go back to Neolithic time, but the, and, it, and uh, the, Mino the term Minoan came from King Minos. It actually was a King Minos. And in Greek legend, uh, the, the has to do with the, the labyrinth and the, the minotaur. The, um, and so anything having to do uh, with that civilization is called Minoan, which is derived from King Minos. King Minos. Minos or Minos. I'm just not quite sure how to pronounce it myself. <laughs> and the king isn't around, ha hasn't been around for some 3,500 years or so. No. Um, but the legend was in Greek legend was uh, the legend of the Minotaur, and the uh, every year, the uh, there would be a group of uh, young people who would be taken to Crete and be sacrificed to this beast. And uh, uh, Theseus, I think it was, uh, who was the Greek hero who went and killed the Minotaur, uh, went into the labyrinth. And there's a whole uh, legend in, in Greek mythology. Um, but the but the orange origins of a lot of the stuff, uh, people just didn't know about until the excavations. And one of the problems, which is central to the book, um, was uh, the script that they use in writing. One of the scripts they use in writing, which was called Linea A. Uh, Linea B is uh, has been translated, but Linea A has been defied all attempts to translate it. So that's kind of one of the main elements of this book. All right. Now, you established the Minoan situation at the very beginning of the book. Yes, yeah. And then you jump another 4,000 years to come up to the, <laughs> the present time for your characters and the story. But there's that relationship to the mystery of the Minoan disappearance. Yes. And the legendary writing that was very hard to, well, to read because it was a whole different system of scripting. Yeah, uh, to this day, uh, it's, uh, uh, Linear B was deciphered by a very smart amateur uh, cryptologist named Michael Ventris. And um, he figured it out that it was an ancient form of Greek. Uh, the, he died, unfortunately, at a very young age uh, in a car accident, which I've, which was kind of, I, I kind of had a, a fanciful theory behind that, 
which I've included in the book. And the, con and the idea is, was if had he lived, he would have been able to decipher linear A, but there are some bad people going back a long time who don't want linear A um, deciphered because it would reveal their presence and their rather sinister uh, yeah, aims they, that they people have. People with a sinister plan of their own wouldn't want the, just the uh, language of that area clarified because yes. it would expose them. Yeah, it's crazy, and, but I thought I'd go with no, it. Paul, in your, in your book, The Minoan Cipher, you have created a modern group of people mm -hmm. based on the very theories that we've just spoken about. Yes. You've got the good guys, the bad guys, a yeah. uh, whole bunch of other people who are either good or bad. There's one fellow in your story, Paul, that starts out really bad, and he becomes sort of a, if not quite pure, at least helpful. Yeah, it's, it's kind of fun to do. It's, with, you can get into uh, doing cardboard figures, very, very good, very bad, and I didn't want to do that. And this guy provided an opportunity to go against type. Uh, when I first started writing about it, he was really bad. But I decided that he had some issues and made him a more complicated when character. When you're writing, as this is fiction, yeah. as you've got a bad guy, and in the early part of the story, what was this, Leon, Leonidas? Leonidas, yeah. Leonidas is yeah. his name. Yeah. And he's real rotten. I mean, he's blowing up ships. He's, he's, oh, he's rotten, yeah. He's mean <laughs> rotten. Yeah. And then much later on, I don't want to give too much away in your storyline, but maybe he's not so bad. When you're writing this, Paul, yeah. what, is it, what is your imagination doing? What are you, where, where do you find, where do you figure the character is going to be later on? Are you, are you making notes all over, or do these things just evolve? Uh, constantly making notes, yeah. I've, that's one of my big problems, my wife always kids me about the yellow legal pads I have all over the place. Um, but when I wrote him, I wrote him as a straightforward assassin. And I wasn't quite sure what would uh, happen to him. Uh, but he would probably come to a bad end. Uh, but as I tried, started to develop the character, I thought, started thinking, well, why is he the way he is? Why is he doing that? And uh, so I came up with a, a, a biography for him, and I, that influenced his behavior later on. As a writer, you, you're kind of an uh, amateur psychologist and um, in that you're always examining the motives of your characters, or you should. I mean, you can write a straight through action uh, thing, and uh, I'm sure it would sell a kazillion, but I, I was always interested in, tr in character, anyhow, developing character and, and keeping it. I should mention, though, the, uh, this is a sequel. My first book in the series was called The Emerald Scepter. The, uh, what's the name? The, the Emerald Scepter. Emerald Scepter. Yeah. After I was writing with Clive Cussler, and uh, I did eight books with Clive. And then when our collaboration ended, I spoke to his agent, and I said, I don't know what to do next. And he said, well, um, uh, why don't you write an adventure book like they have been? And I talked to Clive, and I said, I don't know what to do next. And he said, why don't you write your old Socarides series? So I went with the adventure book. Now, Socarides was a character in one of your earlier books. Is that right? Yes. And uh, so you, the, the, uh, the point came where Kessler said to you, you've got a character, bring him back. Yeah. So I wrote... The Emerald Scepter, which introduced a whole new gang of guys, Matinicus Hawkins, who is an ex-seal and an underwater engineer at Woods Hall. Uh, and there are three others. And I, I kind of wanted a little bit like uh, all that they would all have issues, some baggage. Um, and then th that turned out pretty well. I, I think it was a good book. It's still selling pretty well. And I had had some uh, a lot of interest in my old Socarides series, so I, re I brought that back after 15 years. 
I, I revived, and that was in Gray Lady that came out a couple of yeah, years we'll ago. Yeah, we'll talk about the book with Sacco, uh, with Sacco, Sacco, Sacco character. Saccharides. Saccharides character. Maybe I should just quickly run through. I did six books of the Saccharides. Or uh, he was the hero. Yeah, these are the Cape Cod-based private detective, uh, fisherman diver. Then Clive Cussler asked me to uh, write a new series with him. Uh, it was a spin-off of his very successful uh, new, uh, Dirk Pitt series. So I, I did eight books with him. Yeah. Uh, then after that collaboration ended, uh, I just uh, I went back. I did the Emerald Scepter. Uh, then I brought back this Socrates, and then I did this, and now I'm working on another Socrates. So I'm doing two series, so it's very crazy, I think. Yeah, uh, well, all right. Now, in, in a book that you've written called The Gray Lady, uh, mm -hmm. Sock is in that. Yes. But in the Minoan cipher, you've got a different fellow. You've got yeah. Matt. Yeah, M Matinicus Hawkins. Matinicus Hawkins. Yes. So you've got two separate yes. but major characters, and they're the good guys. Yeah. But they've got a little trouble in their past, each of them. Yeah. Um, the, in, in the Minoan cipher, <laughs> Sorry, New England accent, cipher. Uh, New England and the New England cipher, um, it's a group of four. There's Matinicus, who's uh, a former Navy SEAL who left uh, the Navy in disgrace. Uh, and then there's uh, his comrade, his, oh, his ex wife, Abby. Their marriage broke up uh, because he didn't do well with his. Uh, uh, failings of the Navy. Then there's an ex-comrade in arms who feels a bit guilty that he didn't support uh, Matt going, was going through his thing. And then there's a, a young woman named Molly Sutherland, Sutherland who's a compu computer whiz, but she was physically assaulted in, in the service and, uh, and, and, and was kind of cast aside. So I brought all these people together. I introduced there, there them. There are a lot of people. I introduced them in the Emerald Scepter. And I brought all these issues in because I thought it, what would be more, um, it, it, when I was writing with Custer, we had two characters. They were a married couple, uh, Paul uh, and Gabby Trout. And that made for a very interesting dynamic in writing these action things. And I thought, well, for purposes of this guy, this gang, why not have a guy working with his ex-wife? Because he would have even more issues to deal with. You, you seem to take delight in creating a character and then giving him a lot of trouble. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's, we're, uh, we're, we're not on the, psychi the psychiatrist's couch right now, <laughs> but Paul, you, you're maneuvering these people and giving them all sorts of shortcomings as well as heroic episodes and forward movement. Well, if, if you go into the historic narr narrative formula, going back to Odysseus or even before the biblical stuff, <coughs> you have a hero, and the hero has a goal, and the, there are obstacles in the way of his achieving that goal. And um, some of the obstacles are external, guys shooting at him or throwing bombs at him. Um, some just, of them just, just for a throwaway, throwing bombs at them. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. And some of them are internal. Uh, self-doubt, um, overconfidence. Uh, and this has been a classic going back for a million years. And this is still the formula that you see. If, if in its most refined form, the hero changes, the experience changes, so at the end of the narrative, something has happened. Um, I'm writing entertainment, so I'm not dealing with a, with a fine um, tip pen. I, I just want the guy to get through and, and not get killed and, and do, so that something bad happens to the bad guy at the end. Yeah, well, both of the books we were talking about today, the new one called The Minoa and Cypher, mm -hmm. and one of your older books called Gray Lady, the hero is, 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 well, is the good guy. Yeah. But he's got faults. He's uh, dependent on a good buddy in both cases. Yeah. Uh, so that he isn't able to march through as the hero and clean it all up by himself. He needs help. 
Oh yeah, you got to be fallible. I mean, if you look back at Odysseus, which I just mentioned, I mean, uh, he, in in many ways, he was kind of a jerk. He. <laughs> but you wrote him that way. That, I mean, <laughs> that was Homer's. If he was a superhero, just went through beginning to end, and, and whipping all these monsters, but he's a very fallible guy. He's he's uh, very self-centered. He's a little wily, a little shrewd. Um, he doesn't really, he uses people, and that was written, I don't know, five or six thousand years ago. <laughs> and that's, but that's what makes him uh, an interesting character. And the same with my characters, if they march through and they just, you know, bad guys, it would be parody. So uh, I think having the, some baggage, making them fallible, are, are what intrigues people, making when them you're, human. When you're writing these uh, novels, they are fiction, and the hero that you've created gets into a little trouble. Do the characters speak to you at all? Do they tell me, do they tell you, that's enough, or let's get this straightened out, <laughs> or do I need help? I mean, do they start giving well, you imaginations and writing? I, when I taught this writing class, not very well, but years ago, um, my biggest piece of advice to uh, newer writers was to know your characters. And do, do the biography, think of the character, and how the character would react in a given situation. Mm -hmm. uh, then, once you set up the situation, it, it becomes easier. You know, you've lived with this character for a while, you've, you've got him down to a point where you like him or you don't like him. And so, once the, the bad guys do their thing, what would he do? Would he retreat? Would he, would he run away? Would he, is he a violent guy? What, what would he do? And, and yeah, in a sense, the, the character, I would never say the character takes over because you're always in control of the character, you hope to be. But knowing the character allows you to to see where he's going. Yeah, sort of a self-analysis when you're writing, saying, "Wait a minute, he's in this particular spot. What what would he do based on what I've written about him before?" Yeah, I when I first started off, I always came off of 25 years as a newspaper person, and which was a, I tended to be an observer. And when I wrote my first Socrates book, I had uh, the detective in a situation where, where he was observing and my very smart editor at the time said, no, 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 you gotta have him react. He's not gonna just stand there and see bad stuff done. He's gotta react. And I thought, of course he is. But I was thinking as a reporter. Yeah, not that's, that's a major difference, Paul. Uh, as a reporter, you're reporting facts as they've already happened. Or as they are happening, yeah. Or, or as they are happening, yeah. if you're writing quick deadlines, I guess. Yeah. And as an author, you can create things that have happened and uh, things that are going to happen. Yeah. You've and got it, a whole other area, a wide open area in front of and you. And if you don't have a character who becomes involved or reacts, uh, then you've got a really boring character. Um, what I, like I do uh, sometimes is I'll say, okay, I'll bring it up and that narrow it up to a certain point and I'll say, what are the options here? And uh -huh. I'll list option one, what happens to option two, option three, and they might come up with six options. And then that's when the art part comes in, I'll say, this I think, he would not do this, cross it out, he would not do this. This is where it's gonna go. And the most difficult part for me, and I'm sure with a lot of writers, is the plotting. What, what, <laughs> what's the character gonna do? Where are they going to be? How are they going to get there? Because you really have to think that stuff through. Um, and Wait, do you ever reach a point where in your storyline, you're pretty well along, you've written a great deal yeah. about this character and the things that have happened to him and the people around him, and then you realize there's something you can do, but you'd have to rewrite something earlier in order to make it make sense and make a path to it? Yeah. Um, a couple of points. One is I don't usually spend a lot of time on the prologue or the uh, or the first chapter because I know that something will develop 
later on, uh -huh. and I'll have to go back and change it. So I'll try to get the bare bones thing. Another thing is I found, and I'm sure other writers have found it too, that maybe in the first few chapters, you'll throw something in, and um, I'm not quite sure why you did it, but uh, on chapter 11, it become you get into a situation, it becomes apparent why you did it, and you say, oh no, I must have been <laughs> thinking about that, or I'm convinced that a lot of stuff happens in the subconscious anyhow. So if you're dealing with these things, they're always on your mind. Um, it, something's cranking back there somehow that, that maybe um, gave you a little yeah, like it, pop, it pops up later. And yeah, and I know it's crazy. I'll do go, you surprise yourself sometimes? Yeah, and I'll say, oh, <laughs> now I know. What <laughs> the, they're fictional characters. They're all brainwave. They've written them, and suddenly you say, that, "That's right. That's why he did that one." Well, these are now that these are first. This the Socrates books, first person books, um, and they're set on Cape Cod, an area that I'm familiar with, mostly Cape Cod. And in some some extent, they're a little easier. Uh, but when you get to these things, and you're balancing uh, three or four plots and subplots, where you've got a raft of characters, um, it, it it becomes really difficult. And just keeping track of everyone and making sure they're going to be at a point. How did they how did they get there? You know, you got to go. Uh, look up the time, see how if it's possible for so them to get here or there, and then the bad guys. How are you going to get the bad guys? Because so, and the point of view. Um, each chapter, this is basic writing. Um, this is basically one point of view. But when you're writing multiple things, each chapter has has to have its own point of view. Whether it's the point of view of the bad guy, a point of view of the good guy, or one of the minor characters who gets blown away, you have to see through things through his eyes. If you don't, the reader will will know that and get messed up. You don't want that to happen. Yeah, in both of the books we're talking about today, the new one, the Minoan Cipher, and one of your older books, The Great Lady, uh, there are longer chapters, not very long, mm -hmm. but longer, and then there are very short two or three page chapters mm -hmm. that set up a scene change or a, a little flip mm -hmm. to get, get along. Uh, is that uh, typical writers, or I, I think it depends on the writer. Um, I, for you take Jane, James Patterson, who writes in very very short chapters, and and then um, some writers will write in short chapters toward the end of the book, where you're moving the action along faster. <coughs> I think I may have done it, and I think I do it sometimes. Uh, you know, there's a setup, and then there's, it's almost three acts like a play. There's a setup, and then the, the connecting part, then the end. That's when the chase is on. Yeah. Sherlock Holmes and Watson, the chase is on. Then you want bup, 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 bup. Well, in a movie, short takes, uh, scene, scene, scene changes. It picks up the rhythm, and you, you start moving toward the screen almost physically because it's, it's spinning. Yeah, and the, the idea is that the, at the end of each chapter, that the, if you're doing it right, especially with a thriller or an adventure, you want the reader to say, oh, I, I can't stop here, I gotta go on. And, and I hear that from people who say, well, you kept me awake all night long. And that's a nice thing to hear, even though I don't. <laughs> well, I'll just add one more. You kept me awake all night long, Paul <laughs> Capricos, because uh, I read after I go to bed. I put, mm, on, the, yeah, the I good, I put on the good light. Yeah and put on my glasses and pick up one of your books to read. And it is, I, I can't say, wait a minute, when I can't leave it now, I've got to stay up a little longer. It's especially important with thrill. It's, it's also, even in these which are a le less madcap pace, where, the, where you've got a private detective who's trying to assemble all, all the pieces of the puzzle, which are the pieces of the puzzle of people, and he's trying to put them together. And he, he goes against that obstacle, and um, you, you can't do. And I have to resist the temptation at the end of the chapter to say, "Oh, little did I know that blah 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 was going to happen." It, you do your foreshadowing in a, a more subtle way if you if you if you can. Yes, I've noticed that in reading both 
both books, The Gray Lady, which is the older book, and then the brand new one, Paul, called The Minoan Cipher, that uh, I found out that there's a plot line that goes back and says that's why that particular person was in that story yeah, back there. Yeah. Because I've wondered, and some of the characters seem to float in and out of the storyline, and sure enough, later on, there's a reason for it. Yeah, but you can't, you can't shortchange a reader. You have, readers will notice things, and even the little things, and you can't leave them hanging. You have to, you can't suddenly introduce a characteristic and a character on page 200, and because the reader will instinctively say, Where'd this come from? But a quick anecdote, when I was writing with Clive Cussler, I was working on a book, I think it was called uh, Polar Shift. And I, I, I dealt with Clive and his agent, and they, they usually saw the manuscript as it evolved. And toward the end, it got to be a, be a big rush, and uh, they, I, they didn't like the ending, but it was <laughs> too late to do anything about it. And I said, well, trust the readers. You know, I'm, trust the writer, trust your reader. But, this is big time publishing. So we did it and the book came out and I was convinced that it was a rotten book. It's, after you do these books, you, you're just exhausted. And you say, oh, I want a piece of junk. And there was, but um, that came out in May, June, that, no, that fall, that fall, it uh, hit number one on the New York Times <laughs> bestseller list. So, so the book that you felt wasn't and quite I, right yeah, ended I got up a, on top of the New York Times book yeah, chart. Yeah, it, it bumped Dan Brown off, and I, I got a call from his agent, Peter Lampack, a great agent. And he said, I just talked to Clive, and he said, I cannot believe that this, this book hit number one. And, and I said, I knew it right along. I was going to hit number one, and they said, went back. So we had a little fun with that. You just never know. And on that successful <laughs> note about the, the not so good book that ended up number one on the Times chart, we're just about out of time, Paul. We're talking today not only of the book The Gray Lady, which is an earlier book by our author. There's Gass. another one in the works, by the way. It's called Shark Bait, working title. It'll be number eight in the Socarides series. All right, Shark Bait yeah. is the new title. And yeah. that'll be discussed in one of our future Books in the World program when yeah, we ask so. you back. I hope it'll be done and released later this year. <laughs> never. We'll look forward to it, Paul. And yes. I want to thank you for being our guest today. Our guest, the author, Paul Camprikos, and the book called The Minnow and Cipher, the new one. Or if you want to go back into his author's list, a long pile of books. Everything is available. Just go on <laughs> Just a, look a, for Amazon it. or internet, and every all my old books have been are back in print. And with that, we thank you very much, Paul, for coming in today, so we could talk over the new book and bring back the characters and some of the other ones. Great. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you me. very much, and we thank you for looking in on today's program of Books in the World, a presentation of the Cape Cod Writers Center. And as always, we thank you very much for viewing. Thank you, Paul. Thank you.